So we're going to be continuing this morning our theme of Christians and government. And for just a little bit of review, we talked for in the first session about God's institution of government in the Old Testament, how government is ordained by God. Government is fallen with mankind. And, our, and governments are a thermometer on where society is. What a government is like is a little indication of where a society is. I'll step back a little bit so maybe you all can see a little bit better. Also, government accomplishes God's purposes. And that's no matter whether or not it's a Christian, well, a Christian government maybe is an oxymoron, but whether it's a, at all a godly government at all. And government is accountable to God for what they do. And then we moved on to the New Testament and talked about what does the New Testament say about Christians and government. We talked about the two kingdom concept that there's a kingdom here and there's a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom that we're a part of. We looked at some objections or some arguments for why Christians should participate in government and then some answers from the Bible about that. We also saw that governments are beasts, and no amount of Christians in that government can change that. But my favorite part is this morning, the Christian in government today. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is our responsibility, and we're going to look at what, are, what is the responsibility of a Christian in a society in relating to or being part of government. And then we're going to look at some things that we shouldn't do that are not the responsibilities of Christians, some reasons why, some objections to the, the biblical plan for how, or how Christians should relate to government. And then we want to take a decent amount of time taking a look at somewhat of a history lesson on Christians, peace-loving Christians who got involved in government and how that went for them. We want to look a little bit at some influences that we face today that would push us towards patriotism, towards involvement in government. And then we want to take a look again a little bit at what should kingdom Christians be doing. I saw a, a church sign recently that kind of reminded me of this. It said, the donkey and the elephant can't help you. Follow the lamb. The point is the solution is Jesus. All the problems in the world can't be solved by government. Government has a lot of trade-offs. You do this to prevent this, but then you make this other problem. But that's not how Jesus' solutions work. Jesus' solutions are real solutions, are heart solutions. And we're going to get into that some more. Thank you, Titus. So our responsibilities. What does the Bible say about responsibilities of Christians? We're to pray. Timothy says, first of all, that, and Paul says to Timothy, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So we should be praying for our government leaders. <clears throat> Another one is we're to be sharing the gospel. And in Acts 9.15, God is talking to Ananias about Paul, right after Paul had experienced his conversion experience. And he said, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Now, we might not always have an opportunity to preach to government leaders, but I think government leaders have their eye on society. And when they see peace-loving Christians in that society, it should make an impression. They should be seeing truth. It should be a witness. And while we, should, we are to be peace-loving, we are, God has made, I think we're, we're clear that we're not to be, we're to be non-resistant. We're not to be resisting evil people. We should still engage with society. And if you look back at <clears throat> many of the early Anabaptists, they engaged with society they had discussions about what the government should or shouldn't be doing, what God had put the government in place to do. And we don't just hole up by ourselves. We have this, uh, so I heard someone say yesterday that um, 
way back that the Mennonites made a deal with the devil and they said, we won't bother you and you don't bother us. And I think sometimes it's true. It's not the way it's supposed to work. And we'll talk a little bit more about fighting the way we are supposed to fight. And I think we also need to embrace the tension in our conviction. We say that God has put government in place to reward good and punish evil, to keep the peace, to protect the innocent. And we also say that we as Christians are not supposed to do that. That can, cre- that can create some tension. It can be hard to defend that belief. But I think we need to embrace that and be willing to accept that God has done it that way. And I don't qu- totally understand why, but that's what he said. Another word to obey, and we, we looked at this a little bit in Romans 13 back a few months. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive the condemnation upon themselves. So Paul is telling us we're to be obeying. Next, we're supposed to honor, and this can be extra difficult when the people in government don't feel very honorable, but they, we still need to be, we need to be honoring Peter says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And I think it would be fair to say that um, the king in, his, in Peter's day was no more honorable than the king's today, and he still asks us to do that. Also, Romans 13 tells us that we're to pay our taxes. Render to all what is due to them. Tax to whom taxes due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So again, that idea of honor comes out. And then, what are we not to do? I believe that we should not be holding government office. Maybe there'd be a few possible exceptions. I have a friend who is a coroner, and he believes that that's God's calling because as a child, he was very much helped when his mom died, and the coroner was a Christian and was able to to really help him through that time, and he feels like that's his calling. Although there's there's some serious questions I have about even that. Um, How do you get elected as a coroner without campaigning, without joining a political party? He did not campaign to be elected, and he was still elected, although he did join the Republican Party. So I, I would have some questions about that personally. We also should not devote too much time and energy to reading and discussing politics. I can enjoy this sometimes, but I think it's very easy for us to go from analyzing and to, to you know, it just, it, it, it's just that it begins that slippery slope when we get too involved. And I also believe that um, we shouldn't be voting. So that's, that's my, I'm going to, I'll, I'll defend that a little bit more going forward in the um, section on why. So why should we not be getting involved in government? One is God is in control. And God doesn't need us to elect good politicians to get his, to get, to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. God used very evil people to accomplish what he accomplished sometimes. He doesn't need us to disobey him to accomplish what he wants to get done. And, and if we can just trust in that, that God's will will be accomplished uh, we talked in the, in, the, in the first session on this about God's will is accomplished by government, always. And he may have a quite different idea about how he wants to accomplish what he wants to accomplish than we do because we don't understand God very well. And sometimes God doesn't even use the best candidate to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. You look in the Old Testament, God talks about the various kings that he set up, very, very evil people to to get done what he wanted to do. And sometimes the best candidate might not be the best candidate, or who we think is the best candidate might not be the best candidate. Um, In the election where 
Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy were facing off. Many Mennonites, Anabaptists decided this is the time to vote because it's so bad we can't have a Catholic president. Well, they both got to be president one time or the other, and turns out maybe he wasn't the best candidate after all. I don't know. You can argue which is better, but neither of them were very good. Another reason for us not to get involved in politics is that Christ is the center of his kingdom. And if we're busy going after somebody who can save the kingdom, now we kind of lose focus on keeping Christ in the center. Another reason that we shouldn't get involved, politics is the business of compromise. And we try to solve, politics tries to solve problems through compromises. And what is, the, what is the, the lesser of two evils? If we make this law, there's going to be some unintended consequences, but maybe it'll avoid this bad thing. It's not the business of Christians. I think we definitely should compromise the next time we decide what the color to paint the walls if we disagree. But on fundamental principles of Christianity, on principles where the Bible tells us clearly, on principles that God has spoken, it's not about compromise or choosing the lesser of two evils. And I think as you, as, as someone, maybe they begin by being interested in discussing politics and getting drawn in, and maybe they vote, it begins a slippery slope. And I can't say where, you, where, where uh, right ends and, and wrong begins or where, where uh, you might be, con- be sinning, but it seems like as you move down that prog- progression, you, you begin going down a slippery slope towards involvement, and there's a lot of reasons why being involved in politics are not good. And once we participate in government, it's very hard to keep, to be non-resistant. There's so much of government that's about enforcing the law, that's about restraining evil, and God's designed it to work that way, but I don't think he asks us to be a part of that. And true and lasting change, change that can really make a difference, comes from the heart, not from regulation. I don't know of any example of someone who could say, I got saved because there was a law against doing the thing that I was doing that was sin. It just doesn't work that way. True change comes from the heart. And I think if we begin voting, if we get, begin involvement in politics, we start to focus on change, external change, instead of change from the heart. We start focusing on the candidate that will help our business thrive the most, that will be the best for us financially. And we lose focus on the really important issues that Christians are supposed to be focused on. And I don't think we can really put energy into making political change and heart change. I think as we put energy into political change, we will put less energy into creating heart change around us. Another problem with Christians voting is Christians voting against each other. Mm -hmm. It happens a lot. And so I don't know how that could be thought of as doing any good. And you can, you can say, well, uh, any Christians who aren't voting the way I do certainly aren't thinking clearly. But, but think with me for a minute. I think Christianity can tend towards political conservatism. But Christianity is also a religion of compassion and caring. I think you could make the case that those on the less conservative side of the political spectrum maybe do a little better job of that. And so we have Christians who are voting against each other. They vote for both parties. And so really what ultimately good is happening. So I've kind of laid out my case for why I think we shouldn't be involved well, what are the objections you hear? Why, why do you, what do you hear? Reasons that people say, or what maybe you feel, reasons that you think Christians should be involved in politics, that Christians should vote, that they should. What, what are those reasons? Because I would like to take some time to look at that a little bit. Uh, we're going to reinforce the voting against each other 
It's the same in war. If Christians join the military, they're out there shooting each other. Mm -hmm. That's bizarre. And so when I think about the Roman Catholic Church, all over the world, whenever you have a skirmish or a problem, you have Roman Catholics shooting Roman Catholics. If that doesn't make sense to you, why does voting make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's so many scenarios you could paint, but the, the point being here, God has an interest in it. It's almost like we're saying we shouldn't have any interest in it, but God does, or he wouldn't ordain, he wouldn't oversee it, he wouldn't use it. So just, yeah, just a thought that just occurred to me this morning. <laughs> Yeah, and absolutely, I, I, there is certainly a continuum, I know I certainly have an interest, and uh, you know, as I've said, I don't believe it's right for us to vote, but it, it is a continuum, and I don't think we can draw a black and white line that absolutely here is sin and here is not, but the further we go down that slippery slope, the more likely we are to end in a place where we don't want to, and that's what, uh, as we get to some of the history, I want to look at how that worked for, for other peaceful Christians in the past. You know, also I've heard, you know, we should be salt and light. We can be salt and light by involvement in politics because we can change. And my thought to that is that, and, and different, different things, you know, maybe by joining government, by voting, or, or any sort of involvement in government, we can make change. And, and that is true. But I think salt and light, if you think about how that illustration that Jesus used, neither of those coerce. Both of those things are gentle influences. And if you think of salt, it doesn't force you to do anything. If you think of light, you don't need to turn towards it, but it, shine, it, it shines a light. And to me, that's the, that's the place where Christians ought to be. Any other objections that you've heard or that you, you would like to raise? military, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? I don't think most of us here you know, would believe that way or would do that. Um, and so we believe in that area that Jesus teaches participation in government to the extent which it doesn't violate our conscience. And so as you look at um, you know, the subject of voting, and I've been on both sides of that you know, equation personally, um, and I wonder sometimes if the the level, like the level of involvement in government that we have, if, if our hearts are not turned toward that as something that, oh, this is going to save the world, and and there is, um, so there's a dependence on God, and they're really looking past government. It's not looking for the solution, um, and and it's a and and we're being asked for involvement as Christians. We're being asked to give our opinion. Is that something that, that rises to the level, like, like you could use the same logic to not pay 25% of your taxes, and Jesus clearly gave us kind of direction there. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of just wondering, um, like, if there is an involvement that the government is asking, like, what, you know, where, is it where we violate our conscience? Like, is the action that actually violates our conscience? And I get the thing, of course, and why we would hold office, because, you know, there's, you know, required violations. But, you know, at what point does, you know, do we say, well, we're going to participate because... That's not a violation of our conscience, the action itself or what mm -hmm. we do. And I don't think that voting would be a violation of my conscience personally if, like, I think Australia requires all citizens to vote. I think I would. Um, but I just think that, I, I, well, let me say it this way. I have yet to meet the person who w w would urge me to vote who 
still has his, his, who still is kingdom focused. And I'm not saying they don't exist, but they are few, I, I would say. Uh, that is, tr- well, well I, I said someone that would urge me to vote. I, I'm not saying someone who has voted. I see a difference there. Someone who says, you're a Christian. Well, you're not fulfilling your duty because you're not voting. I've definitely heard that. And, and I have yet to meet someone who I would say still has a kingdom focus. Franz. I don't know that I can speak to that. I, I couldn't say for sure. I mean, I believe you that they did. Um, I, I, yes, I do have some questions. And, 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 if, and it, we, I think last time we talked about the, the Second Great Awakening and how it had a very political focus that I think was wrong. And it resulted in the Civil War in some ways. It resulted in prohibition, which I think by all accounts was pretty much a failure, at least in my mind. Yes. That's fine. things where 
a certain king kills another guy, <laughs> and now he becomes the, I mean, a, a guy kills a king, the king, now he becomes a king. Uh, there's a guy who, named Muhammad, for example, who he wants to be the king of Arabia, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill all the Jews and the Christians, and I'm just going to, and he goes with his men and, and swords, and he does it. He becomes a king. So, I mean, at the end of the day, did God allow him to become the king of Arabia? I mean, maybe he did. God allowed him. I mean, everything that happened, God allowed. But, I mean, yeah, God allowed poor people to be in the street. Yeah, God allows the poor people to be in the street. Uh, God allows the hungry. Yeah, God allows the hungry. But he also pushes us. Hey, feed the hungry. Change you. So basically change your society with your actions. Mm -hmm. Feeding, helping, telling people about God, you know. So I think it's good to ask the question, how much involvement? I think brother, I forgot his name, <laughs> Cleon. He said, how much involvement we should have? I mean, I think the question is, is not necessarily wrong to ask to ask that question. How much involvement you should have? You should pay your taxes, that's for sure. Now, you mentioned if you were living in Australia, you said, and they were told that everyone needs to vote. I think you said you would, you would do it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's something to think about, you know, how much involvement, involvement people should have in, and people that believe in God, not necessarily because they do one of these things. Oh, I, somebody feels they should vote. And then, oh, this person's not a Christian, or it, it's, not, it's a, it, you know, I don't think it should be seen that way. It should be seen as, hey, if the Spirit guides you to do that, at the end of the day, in this country, voting makes the next president. Or, or faking, or, you know, sticking, sticking ballots in the machine also makes the next president. <coughs> you know, the evil also makes the next president lead. It's not just God. It's because God wants good things, but not everything that happens is God's will. That's why it says, you need to pray. Your will be done, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, it is his will, but in earth, it's not automatically. He says, you need to pray for this to happen, that this is will be done. Because sometimes the devil is also doing things, and not always his will is done. Yeah, that's true. And I think what I would say to that a little bit is, Peter <laughs> thought for sure God's will wasn't being done. And evil forces were getting the upper hand when Jesus got killed. And so he said, we've got to stop this. And it wasn't wrong what he did, because he was still living under the Old Testament law. But Jesus said, no, this is not what we're doing because God's higher purpose is going to be accomplished by the evil forces getting to do what they want to do, pushed by Satan to do it. And so I think we need to be really cautious saying that we are going to um, <clears throat> accomplish God's will by trying to influence politics. I saw a license plate the other day. It said, be change. And I think that's what God's calling us to do. We are to be the change, not to enforce the change, not to push the change, but rather be the change ourselves. I really appreciate that. And then if we just, if we trust God to take care of the rest. You know, people say Christians can improve society by participating in government. But the problem is, the method is violence. Mm -hmm. Paul said, Romans 3, 8, why not say, as we are slanderously reported in some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. When we think we have to get involved with making things happen the way we think they need to happen, we're doing evil that good may come. And good doesn't come from evil, even if we, no matter how much it, we think it might. We've got to remember that we can never go against God's commands to accomplish his purposes. And Jesus and the Christian's way of making change is from the heart, addressing the root of the problem. That's lasting change. That's real change. Another reason I hear that why we should be voting or why should we should be involved in politics is we've got to choose the lesser of two evils. We know this guy's bad, but this guy's worse, so at least pick him. And to me, that really stands out that, again, it's that compromise. Maybe perhaps if you can show me an absolutely upstanding Christian godly man that, uh, that is a candidate for an office, I might think about voting for him, but I haven't seen one in a very, very long time. Another objection is this kind of straw man argument. Well, then are all people in government and the military, are they all, none of them are Christians? And I say, absolutely, I don't believe that. Are they all doomed for hell? No, I don't, I don't agree with that. Because we're not saved by our works. And people, 
may not be exactly where God wants them to be right now. Living a perfect life is not how we get into heaven, but I want to live consistently according to God's will to the best of my knowledge, and I'm not going to judge someone else who, who doesn't understand what God has shown to me. And I am also thankful for the grace that covers me when I fail because there are inconsistencies in my life. But that grace is not an excuse for me to go against what I know. Another objection is, what about those saved that were part of the Roman army in the New Testament? Jesus really admired the faith of the centurion who asked that his servant be healed. But there's no indication given that he ever became a Christian. Peter baptized the centurion as well. And God saved him right where he was. In that place, in the middle of an evil kingdom, in the middle of using violence where, he, where, where the New Testament would ask that he didn't, but God leads us from where we are to where he wants us to be. And we don't know. We don't have the rest of the story. Did he continue as a centurion? The punishment for deserting the Roman military was death. And so the, the, um, the early church in some cases did allow people to remain in the military as long as they served in a non-combatant position. I don't, they, they didn't allow them to join the military, but if they were there, they did allow them to stay in some cases. So that, that uh, but it, but we don't know the rest of the story, what, how God led them, and I think God would have led them to a place that wasn't using violence and force. Or what about all the Old Testament heroes, David and Abraham, all fought? And what I would say to that is what we talked about last time, that idea of a flat Bible where the Old Testament and the New Testament equally apply to the Christians, the believer's life. It's just a fallacy. So I'd like to take most of the rest of our time looking at Christians who said, I'm going to make a difference. And the first one that comes to my mind is William Penn and his holy experiment. And we're still, I would say, definitely receiving blessings from what he did. He, a little background about William Penn. He was living in England and he, was a, he had very wealthy parents and he became a Quaker against the wishes of his parents. And he was actually put in prison for quite a while. And King Charles II owed a large debt to his dad. And when his, his dad died, this debt was, was passed on to him and he arranged to have a large tract of land in the New World instead of payment of the debt. And he had this great idea for a holy experiment, running this new colony on the principles of the New Testament. He negotiated with the Indians to also pay for the land that he bought from them at, for, for a fair price. He envisioned a land with religious freedom, which was very much of a novel idea at that time. He wanted it to be peaceful, and he was going to have no militia, no military at all. He invited persecuted Christians from all over Europe to come and join him in Sylvania or Pennsylvania, and he envisioned this to be a utopia. And people thought this was going to be the thousand-year peaceful reign of Christ. Uh, Edward Hicks had made this interesting painting. I don't know how well you can see it, but here's a lion, here's a lamb, some other animals, and they're all peacefully living together. Over here, William Penn is signing the treaty with the Indians. This was going to be wonderful. And it was wonderful for a little bit. But within eight years, the non-Quakers in his colony really wanted protection from the Indians, and they had to have a militia. His children cheated the Indians and didn't treat them well, and it, it went downhill pretty quickly. So his holy experiment, his Christian government, didn't last very long, only eight years. Next, I'd like to look at the Mennonites in... Germany, Poland, and Russia. And this is a, a very fascinating story. They were very wealthy, very well-to-do. They were doing well. and But they were beginning to lose this idea of the two-kingdom concept and the non-resistance. This was beginning to fade away. And 
the reasoning for, for losing this is, well, they're fighting some very bad things. Communism and atheism, Marxism, was, very, was growing during that time. And uh, during that time, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia was going on. Lots of evil there, certainly. And so they said, well, we need to drop these biblical principles because there's a worse thing coming if we don't. They eventually even removed non-resistance from their confession of faith. And then they got under even more pressure. After World War I, those in Germany, there was uh, the, the United States and its allies had required Germany to pay huge reparations for all the damage they had caused in World War I. So this crippled the German economy. And then the, the Great Depression came, and which made everything even worse. And then along came this man, Adolf Hitler. He was going to be the savior. He was a political conservative, he was a nationalist. His slogan was make Germany great again. Well, not literally, but basically. And uh, he was a very strong leader. Does this sound familiar? Have you, have you seen this before somewhere? He had some stimulus packages to stimulate the economy. He was aiding farmers. And the Mennonites supported and voted for him. Very, very strongly. Ben Goosen, in his article, Hitler's Mennonite Voters, makes the case that um, without the Mennonite vote, Hitler may have lost the election in the free city of Danzig, which that vote made it kind of a puppet state of Germany. It was formerly kind of connected with Poland. And they, Mennonites, loved him. Here is a, uh, a, um, a telegram that the, that the Mennonites sent to Hitler to the Chancellor Adolf Hitler, Berlin. The Conference of East and West Prussian Mennonites assembled today in Tegen Tegenhagen, free state of Danzig, feels deep gratitude for the powerful revival that God has given our nation through your energy and promises joyful cooperation in the upbuilding of our fatherland through the power of the gospel. Faithful to the motto of our forefathers, no other foundation can anyone lay that that, than that which is laid, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He said, we are going to do whatever it takes. And, and there, there's a lot more backstory. There's, there, there was so much support. Basically, uh, the leadership said that anything that Hitler asks of us, we will do no matter whether it conflicts with what we not formally believed. Um, and Hitler even took the time to write a telegram back to them. For your loyalty and your readiness to cooperate in the upbuilding of the German nation expressed in your letter to me, I express my sincere thanks, Adolf Hitler. And this letter, this, this correspondence is not isolated. There were other letters of Mennonites that wrote to him, supporting him, saying, we, you have our full support. We're behind you the whole way. And I do want to say, too, this didn't happen overnight. This was kind of a very gradual thing that had begun to be happening before Hitler came to power. But um, having lost some of those core beliefs, that two-kingdom concept, they were ripe to be deceived. There were Mennonites in the Americas that supported Hitler as well. This is a picture in the front of a Mennonite church in Fernheim, Paraguay, and that is Hitler right behind the pulpit. That's, that's how much they supported him. There's stories of Mennonites in, both, in Canada, especially the United States, who also supported him. This is from a uh, Mennonite woman in her home in the Chorizza colony in Ukraine. Uh, she's sewing with a picture of Hitler up on the wall in their home. This is a, the leadership from the company, um, the Epp firm. They made, they were, they were very, they made a lot of, of things, products for Hitler during the war to support the war. They were mostly, most of the labor was Jewish slave labor. It was terrible conditions to work in the factory, but it's a, it's a Mennonite owned company. And this was not also an isolated instance. Farms and, you know, a lot of uh, Mennonites in, the, in Germany in that area used Jewish slave labor. Uh, there were quite a few who were actually members of the Nazi party. There were even a few who served on the SS de death squads who were going around killing Jews. They worked as guards in the concentration camps. They were given stolen goods that were taken from Jews, either property or goods. They, they were taken that, so they, they were... Very, they went from, you know, being non-resistant Christians, and and, and it, it, yeah, it's the it, the journey from that, and the, how they walked down this slippery slope and ended up 
killing and enslaving Jews. Many served in the military. It was very common. This is an SS regiment of uh, soldiers from the Halbstadt colony in Ukraine. I think this was almost entirely made up of Mennonites. Here is another group of, uh, of a self-defense unit. The, the Mennonites in Ukraine uh, would, would uh, organize self-defense units. As, we're just going to defend ourselves. That's all we're going to do. But then what they really ended up being is just part of the, part of the Nazi military. These are some uh, Mennonite women and children performing. I think they did some singing or something like that for the, the Waffen SS Cavalry Unit. Most of these men in this cavalry unit were Mennonites. And after the war, there were even several Mennonites who were convicted of war crimes uh, in, the, in the trials after the war. Here is um, Mennonites welcoming the Nazi army into the Ukraine. They were saluting and uh, you know, very much, very much supporting them. There were a few Anabaptists that did not go along with the Nazis, but most of them were jailed, killed. Um, this, this, uh, the um, the Hutterites in particular. This is the Ron Bruderhof. They definitely spoke out against the atrocities that the Nazis were were doing. And, and most of them had to flee the country to escape. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, not a not an Anabaptist, but another you know, very outspoken Christian who who worked you know against this and and spoke out against it when so many people around him were were just going along with it because you know they started down this road and they seems they just couldn't stop. In their defense, when they began supporting Hitler, many of them had no idea of what he was going to be doing. You know, they were so enamored by his economic policies and how he was going to save them from the Great Depression and all of these other things that they didn't pay much attention to, to what his values really were. So I do want to be fair in that way. But I think whenever we try to use worldly methods to accomplish Christian goals, it's destined to fail. And if we're going to believe, it, believe that a man rather than God is the solution to our problems, it sets us up to believe lies. And there are many, many more examples of Christians who started going down this road of politics to solve their problems. The Roman Catholics, John Calvin, many of the Reformers, today the Southern Baptists, so many Christians somehow believe that the solution is politics. The solution is a man. And it's just not true. So I'd like to look a little bit what are the influences that might influence us today towards this nationalism, towards politics, towards laying down non-resistance, towards involvement in a way that's, that's not Christian? Because there's a lot of pressures that would want to push us in that direction. Sinister influences and the spirits that are working our government today would more or less want to get involved, maybe uh, to, to counter that the evil on the left and all the evil agenda that they're promoting a bunch of lies about transgenderism, all kinds of moral mm -hmm. issues. I mean, the, there's a lot, lot of things that are developing that are swamping, are taking over in this country like never before, and I don't know. Well, I guess all we can do about it is pray about it. And so so uh, it's getting so bad that we finally got to force ourselves to vote. It's kind of like what Saul said. I didn't want to offer this sacrifice, but it got so, so uh, it was so bad I forced myself. I've definitely heard people talk like that about voting in the last few years. It's so bad, we got to do something. Isn't that stemmed from a lack of trust in God and our hearts turned to fear? And there's plenty of reasons to fear. Mm -hmm. Future coming to us yet? Yeah, and there's probably more more coming. Are we gonna think that a man's gonna solve them for us? 
Are we going to trust God? Jesus talked about it. To me, I think what, what the Mennonites in Germany and, and Russia and so forth, it was financial, it was the money. They could make more money if, they, if Hitler was in charge. Not really. <laughs> they didn't know. There probably would have been some indications if they'd been paying attention. But you're right, they yeah, didn't probably, know. Yeah, probably, but it's... Uh, Germany had recovered from the Great Depression rather swiftly, and even the President of the United States thought that Hitler was doing a great and wonderful job. They had a lot of support. Um, I think one reason that people might get involved, Daryl, is uh, I don't want to be a freeloader. I mean, I want to get involved. I mean, aren't you being a freeloader, Daryl? Don't you feel like you're a freeloader? I've been accused of that anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, and they do that. They hit us up with that really big time. So you feel better in the United States and you finally get home, Martha. Yes, I do. But what are you doing to make the United States great? Mm -hmm. The reality is you are. It's just not as visible. There's, there's a question I have. We're afraid for our, that, you know, we can live quite a peaceful life. Should we rejoice then when we get that answer to prayer? Or should politics be so far away from me as a kingdom building Christian that whether I have peace or persecution there's just no difference I don't have any time to look at that like somehow if I rejoice and bless God for for freedom then I have a political heart because the polit this politician came in thank you Lord for him He's, he made my life easier now so in a sense I don't think we should even have a heart that would 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 change <laughs> whether it's Hitler or or someone else in, in leadership. It's just a question I have. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something else, I guess I forgot it. <laughs> well, I do think, and I think we should engage with our society. I'm not, I'm not at all trying to say that we disengage. We should be engaged. And we also need to be thankful for the good because there's a lot of that. And, and a different leader may bring more good or less good. And I, think, I, th I don't think we should be ignoring that. I think a good follow-up message would be on, you said how you don't believe people can be politically involved and be, you don't know of any that are, that would vote or encourage you to vote and be king, uh, on fire kingdom building Christians. Mm -hmm. So maybe a good sequel to this message would be instead of cursing the darkness now to preach the light on what that actually looks like so we can evaluate ourselves i'm getting there oh we're getting there <laughs> i don't have a lot of time left for it but, but it's, we, we got a little at the end um the other thing so, so back to kind of some influences that would drive us towards this nationalism uh, uh to me one comes to mind is old school country music we have god we have guns and we have country and lots of sexual sin but that's kind of another topic sort of that idea you know we're the old-fashioned people with good values, at least some good values, and uh, we really should be supporting our country. And, and the, another thing is, is the fundamental evangelicals. They've got so many things right, and there's even some things we probably should be learning from them. But non-resistance, the two-kingdom concept, even religious freedom, they're not too sure about anymore, some of them. Yeah, those things are taught against. And I think... I think one of the things where it might hit us the closest is school curriculum. They've got so much good, really good, solid school curriculum, but particularly in Bible and in history, there's really a lot, you know, glorifying violence and, and these wonderful Christian founding fathers, and we've, we talked about that a little bit last time. Let's be careful. I'm not saying we can't use those curriculum, but make sure that we're really communicating truth to our children and not just allowing them to absorb that because w without without a filter without some help to discern what's what's true and then to your point what are our responsibilities what should we be doing i think we need to be learning from history because as we know if we don't learn from history we're doomed to repeat it and then share what we know what we've learned from history for those who don't know so that they don't repeat it either and I think what we really want to be doing is laying down that sword of politics and picking up the sword of the Spirit. We're not 
in this world to be pacifists spiritually. We are to be peaceful in the earthly realm, but we should be fighting the spiritual battles. We should be sharing the gospel boldly, fighting those battles, fighting against the powers of darkness that want to take us down. You know, Peter got out his sword and started swinging to save Jesus. But once he got converted, he knew how to swing that sword of the Spirit. And that's what we ought to be doing. Throw away your mail-in ballot. Don't start down the slippery slope of political involvement by voting. That's At least that's my opinion. Live like Jesus. Give generously. Make a difference. Lay down our lives. We're not asked to die physically right now, but sacrifice for the good of people around us. Love lavishly. Share Christ's love lavishly with those around you and speak the truth. Thank you.